Welcome to The Weekly, a podcast brought to you by Calvary Bible Church. My name is Mark Wicks. You may have noticed I'm not Jay Ewing. I'm filling in for him this week. And I'm here with Jake Bauer from the Boulder campus. Jake works with our student ministry teams. How, how are you doing, Jake? I'm very good. It's good to be on The Weekly. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for doing this with me. So a week ago was an interesting day. We had the uh, convergence of Valentine's Day and Ash Wednesday. So that had me thinking, what is the right way to celebrate a combined Valentine's Day and Ash Wednesday? Uh, You know, it's a good question. And you're asking someone who, uh, to my shame, did one of those two things. (laughs) I'll leave you to guess which one that was. (laughs) Well, seeing as you are currently engaged, I'm going to guess it was Valentine's Day. You are correct. This was, I mean, this was my first official Valentine's Day celebration in my life. So the the time, even Elise and I, who... Yeah, we, we are engaged um, last year during Valentine's Day. I don't even know that we really did anything significant. I think I got her flowers, but that was really it. And this year was the first one where we were like, oh, we can actually have a date. And so we celebrated Valentine's Day. Um, and up to this point in my life, I've never been dating someone during the month of February. Yeah. And so I've never done Valentine's Day. But uh, Ash Wednesday, I, I found out Friday that... Wednesday was Ash Wednesday and was like, man, my church calendar is just not there this year. (laughs) So, but I still, you know, my Lent goal is actually still occurring and was occurring in those times as well. So, you know, we didn't have much Ash Wednesday. I watched uh, Tom's video on Ash Wednesday. So, or on uh, Friday about Ash Wednesday. So that's a celebration. (laughs) But did you do anything for Ash Wednesday? I um I got my parents from the airport. They came they came into town. So it was uh that was that was how we were spending our time was with family. But yes. So neither Valentine's Day or Ash Wednesday. Not period. really either of those things, no. Excellent. But uh, yes. it was very good nonetheless. But. Yes. Yes. My sister blessed us with it was both Elise and I's birthday in January and so she sent us uh some money for a date and we used that for sushi on Valentine's Day, which was very fun. Well, you got to preach on Sunday here in Boulder. How did that go? Always a hard question to answer. Probably uh, the best feedback I I could give to you about how it went is what I heard from other people. So I think generally it went really well. It was really enjoyable. It's uh, a text that I think is relevant to people immediately. And so that's on my side. Um, and I, I walked away. I had a big day Sunday. So at, right after I, I had a leader meeting followed by chaos, our weekly ministry night. And so there wasn't yeah. actually a lot of time to reflect for me on, on that Sunday. Sure. Um, so the most of the reflection has been the last couple of days, but I, as always, I just enjoy preaching. It's just one of my favorite privileges to do. So um, generally I think it went really well. Um, for those of you who might know, Here at Calvary, we're in the middle of a series called Questions Jesus Asked. And so we're just looking at just the questions that that he asked. Many of them, you know, as responses to the questions that people were asking him, it was a way of of him being able to have a conversation and teach us. Um, And this week, our question comes from Mark chapter 9. But before we get into that, um, you mentioned that this section of Scripture highlights a lot of the kind of some failures or shortcomings of the disciples. Uh, Why do you think the author Mark takes time to to kind of dwell on that, to point those out? Yeah, it's a good question. Each gospel, uh, as you go through them, really puts a different view on the disciples. All the gospels have shortcomings on the disciples where they have moments of failure, moments of shortcoming, but Mark, especially in the second half of his gospel, seems to start to highlight the failures and disappointments of the disciples. And I actually think that it's somewhat related to Jesus predicting his crucifixion is that it seems as he continues to predict his crucifixion and it continues to move closer and closer to his death and resurrection, ultimately um, that their failures seem to be more and more prominent, which I don't think is a coincidence. Um, I think it's actually an intentional thing Mark is doing to show us almost the distance between what Christ is doing and how the disciples are living, uh, which makes the point, once again, he's heading to the cross and to the resurrection for the disciples, for all of us. And so this is in the midst of their shortcomings and disappointments and failures. He's still dying for them ultimately. And yet at the same time, it leaves them in a place of response and to the point where 
what happens when Christ is actually crucified, they flee. Um, so I think that's part of what Mark is doing is he's just highlighting the difference of, you know, Jesus is getting closer to the rest or, or to the cross. And as he's doing that, there's actually some distance that's created between him and the disciples. And in our initial passage, their failure is directly contrasted to Christ's prediction about his death on the cross and resurrection, which I think is so fascinating. He, they're, they're talking about who's the greatest and he's talking about, Oh, I'm, I'm going to go die on, on the cross for you. And so this, this, fun rhythm of comparison yeah and you mentioned them talking about who's the greatest and that's our question for this week is you know they're traveling they're on the road and when they they get to their destination jesus has asked them what are you what are you talking about you know it's revealed that they're arguing over which one of them is greater than the other um why do you think they were having that conversation like is it just vanity is there something culturally going on in the greco-roman world i got to talk about this just slightly but i i wish could spend a little bit more time on it, which I guess is what this is for. Um, in the Greco-Roman world, w- what were they thinking about when they were talking about who is the greatest? And Matthew, as I said in the message, reveals that this is a question about who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So not just the greatest now, but like who in the kingdom of heaven is going to be higher in a ranking authority, which also I think is significant that it reveals that they really believe the kingdom of heaven is coming and that Christ is bringing it to them. Um but for them, why are they talking about who is the greatest? I think it is a sense of vanity, but it is a sense of enculturated discussion as well. That it's people aren't shy about wanting to be rulers, authorities who are the great ones in the Greco Roman world. They were the kings, they were those who, ser- who were served. That's what it meant to be great. To be great was to be a king, to be close to the king. And so they're having this discussion about the kingdom of heaven. And I think that's probably some of their motives is, uh, you know, in, enculturated ways where they're talking about what is the culture's vision of greatness? What does it mean to be great in the Greco-Roman world? With that being said, they totally know they're wrong in this discussion, right? Like Jesus asks them, they're silent. They're not uh, proud of the conversation they're having. They they are shy about it and they don't tell Jesus what they're talking about. Um, so I think at least the way they're having this discussion is clearly to them wrong, which is interesting because elsewhere Christ says, you know how the rulers of the Gentiles, they lord it over them, but not so among you. And so this is another instance where he says, well, this is how the culture works in this way. To be great in the culture is to lord your authority over others. But according to the kingdom of heaven, that's not how greatness works. Um, So I think, you know, part of it is really the culture that they're in and they're not unique. We're in a culture that teaches us, here's the path to greatness. Yeah, Take it. Don't apologize for it. Um, in our culture today, I think that that's dripped into everything we see. I talked about influencers. It's dripped into all of our social media. Everything we do is this image of here's how you become great. For It's probably a different answer for students and for those who are working and for those who are in the family. There's always a path toward greatness. And the culture is saying this is what you have to do to be great and they were in a culture that was telling them the same you talked about how like jesus asking the question is is really a way to challenge them you know that the questions he asks are often challenges to us to think about something to evaluate our lives why does why does jesus do that why does he use questions as kind of a challenge yeah it's a good question um and i think it probably depends on the question he's asking frequently i would say questions are disarming they're disarming, right? Where when when you're asked, if someone just came up to me and said, hey, I know you're talking about who, or came up to the disciples and said, hey, I know you're talking about who's the greatest, stop it. Or, or your discussion about who's the greatest, that's wrong. That's very different than leaving the, the ball in their court and saying, what are you talking about? Uh, you know, leaving them an opportunity to self-reflect. Um, and, and it's oftentimes that questions are actually in some ways both a gentler rebuke and the harsher ultimate uh, way of being introspective. It, it's harder to be defensive about questions because it calls you to reflect. And yet at the same time, there is a sense of gentleness to it where it's not an immediate address. And so I think there's been multiple times in my life where someone asks me a question, um, maybe about a behavior I was doing. They're calling me out for something and they say, Hey, I just wonder why, why were you, doing that or when you said this 
um, wh- what do you mean by it? A- and it actually is almost, in a sense, more convicting to me than when someone just comes out and tells me, hey, this is a behavior I saw that you weren't doing well. Um, so I think Jesus is using questions here to disarm the disciples. And in some ways, that's exactly what he does. They're, they're left in silence. And all he needs to do is ask them a question in this passage. There's no follow-up rebuke from him besides just a corrective, here's what true greatness looks like. Um, he, he doesn't linger on it. All he does is ask them a question, and, and they're put yeah. to silence, and he moves on. You talked about how when it comes to greatness, both our definition of greatness and our desire for greatness are faulty. You know, and that was true for the disciples too, you know, which is why they needed correcting. But how do you see that playing out in the world today, that kind of faulty view? Yeah, it, it, yeah, I, uh, you know, so many ways that our definition of greatness is faulty. And I'll talk from my own experience. I'm, I'm younger, so I think greatness means something different to me than it does to probably 40s and 50s and 60-year-olds. Um, or even people younger than me, greatness means mm-hmm. something different. But there's a thousand ways where greatness is faulty in our world today. I, the first that comes to my mind is I think for younger individuals, um, success is greatness. That to, to be great means that you have a well-paying and, and well-esteemed job. Um, it means that you're uh, self-independent, that, that you don't rely on anyone else financially or in any other stage of life. And that's what it means to be great. It probably means you're attractive, um, uh, that you're in shape, uh, in our culture today. These are all images of what, what does it mean to be great? What does it mean to be someone that others admire? It means that you're put together in all aspects of life. You're successful in all aspects of life. Um, and so all those things are really good things at face value, you know, having, having a good job, um, being healthy, all those things can be really, really good things. But when they become, ways where we actually create our own caste system and and say well if you're if you don't eat as well as I do or if you don't exercise like I do or if your job is not as high paying or not as high on the ladder of esteem as mine then clearly I'm I'm greater um so I think that's those are one ways um I would say over time you know especially in Christian circles family can also often be Mm -hmm. an image of greatness where we might look at someone else's family and say, "Oh, they're they're falling apart, or their their kids are yeah. so rebellious." Um, and my kids are put together. My kids aren't doing drugs like theirs, or my kids aren't walking away from the Lord like theirs. Um, and obviously, we never would say these things in the ways that maybe the disciples just openly talk about them. But just look at our hearts, or yeah. look at our gossip, or look at the way that we uh, oftentimes are prone to lead conversations to positively talk about our accomplishments and our success, all images of the way greatness works it, its way into our culture today and into our own minds and our own hearts. Um, I'll just say for the student level really fast, I, I would say grades are a huge deal. Um, we, we live in a place, especially Boulder, in the wider Boulder area, where yeah. grades are so significant to both parents and students where there's this great pressure to be taking all AP classes, all advanced placement classes to be, um, you know, the, the top of the class to be in that top percentage and to have all A's, um, again, just to say good things, but grades are by definition, a comparative system, right? (laughs) Where there's actually to say, like, I want to be top of the class or I want to be top 10 in the class. That's a comparative statement. And so when we're starting to judge others on their grades or on how much they, uh, how well they do in school, then suddenly that's one where we, we have a faulty definition of greatness. Um, even might equate that with intelligence where we say, well, clearly I'm smarter than you because I've got A's and you've got B's or whatever. Um, yeah, just see that among students all over the place today. So those are yeah. a couple examples I think of in our culture. You mentioned the grades example in your message on Sunday, and I, was, I thought that was a good one. You know, it's kind of a good example because it also shows just how we can compare no matter what level we're at. You know, like, yes, you know, the A student, it's really easy to look down on other people. But the B student, you still have, you know, a couple notches below you that you can think, well, at least I'm I'm doing better than them. And I think we right. can do that in so many areas of life. Whatever can make us feel secure, right? Yeah. Like, as long, if I'm feeling For low sure. about myself, whatever I can latch on to to make me feel more confident. Yeah. yeah. You know, one of the areas that I 
wanted to talk about a little bit with this is social media. It's such a, a big factor in our society today. And obviously not everybody listening today is going to be really big into social media, but so many people are, you know, I especially think about, you know, it, it probably just increases as you get younger and younger and younger. Um, I'm just curious, like what, where have you seen, how do you see this issue of greatness playing out in social media, maybe amongst your peers or with the students that you work with? I always call social media pages, and this sounds really negative. I don't mean it entirely negative, but and to put out my bias out there, I'm not big on social media. I personally am am, uh, an advocate primarily against it. I think it's got a lot of good things, but I do want to put out that bias before I say some of what I'll say. Um, But social media is self-advertisement. That's that's exactly what it is. And in some ways, everything we do is self-advertisement. The clothes we wear, the way we present ourselves, that's all self-advertisement. So everyone's self-advertising. That's not entirely a negative thing, but social media is designed to, it's a page devoted to ourselves and to putting forward the image that we want to create. The deceptive thing about social media is it puts forth a false image, a purely positive image. We get to select what we put onto there. And so if if that's true, the desire and design of social media is to create a world where we really can present the greatest version of ourselves and according to our own minds, right? Where we could say, we could filter out, well, here's all the bad things about me. So I'll put those to the side. Here's the great things about me. I'll, mm-hmm. I'll put forth those things. Um, I, I said this on Sunday. I wish I had spent a little more time here of what's our motivation for posting what we post. I had a Instagram page in high school and there was a moment where I was posting things and I had this moment of serious conviction realizing like the reason I'm posting this is so people would think I look good. Like that's really why I'm posting this. I had to delete my Instagram because I realized like, I I think that's why I have this page is to present this positive, attractive, funny version of myself to the world that maybe has some accuracy to it, but really is just this falsified uh, way of making myself look great. Um, and most of us, if we're honest, uh, likely have some of that motivation mm-hmm. in our posts. Not not everyone. I think there's a lot. I said this. I think there's good reasons to have social media. I think it's got a lot of value to it. I still have a Facebook page. I don't use it very frequently. But um, but most of us post things because we want to portray positive characteristics and positive things about ourselves. And that that doesn't always have to be bad. We want people to celebrate with us together our accomplishments and and cool things and to be recognized for those. But Mm -hmm. if the goal is, I just want the approval of people. I I just want people to look at me and to say, wow, look at Jake, look at how how great he is or or how much he's accomplished. Then, you know, I I think we need to listen to that internal voice and say, is this just one way where we're trying to be great in the eyes of man and not in the eyes of, of God? Yeah. And I think that, um, you know, it, like many things, it can be used for good, it can be used for bad, but we also see just so many problems, I think, coming into our society as a result of social media. Are you seeing some of those? What are some of the problems that you might be seeing? Yeah, I mean, what, one is the result that we think of ourselves more frequently because of social media. It, you know, it's uh, it, it's one way that we instantly and default compare ourselves to others. So we're standing in a grocery line, we're uh, in the restroom, we're on a walk, we're anywhere, we're in our cars, hopefully not, but if we're honest, and we pull out our phones and instantly, like your brain has created this pattern of where you go in your phone, you open it and you instantly click the folder with your social media and you click the social media and jump into it. Um, And the first thing you're doing is comparing yourself to others so this there's this default mode it's created where uh well what do i have what do i do when i have spare time i look at other people's lives and and uh align mine with theirs so just the defaultness of social media i think is is a dangerous thing um and it's it's a total reward risk and reward uh based system where the risk is posting this post how will the world respond to it? I don't know. There's risk in that. The reward is, well, how many likes do I get? Mm-hmm. And so suddenly we have a new way to evaluate ourselves based on um, other people's approval or disapproval, right? So I, I remember having, when I was playing the game with social media, I remember posting a post and having, when I would do that, I had this stress. 
that, that would come this anxiety in posting it of man, oh, how many likes am I going to get when I would post it, it there would be this initial excitement when I started to get a lot of likes in the beginning and as they kind of slowed down I would be like oh this is enough like is this going to be yeah. enough likes and um and maybe that's just me I I tend to doubt it a little bit that that's because mm-hmm. I think that's the way the system's designed right? yeah I think I think it's pretty easy to find a lot of discussion of research and statistics that would validate that yeah <laughs> yeah yeah so that's like one it, it, it's really it, what i'd say mark is it's training our minds to evaluate our own value based off of other people's recognition of us um i mentioned i i gave an example in the sermon of like a, a kid kicking a soccer ball and looking to the pew yeah. or to the podiums to see uh what, what are they the on a bleachers. soccer field yeah bleachers <laughs> i'm like not uh, bleachers to see his parents uh if they saw the goal that that's a similar thing to what I'm talking about with social media. I use that example, not as a negative one um, because I think there's a a degree where we're designed to be recognized by one another and those we love and we want security in our relationships. um, And that can be really good, but where it's like this hunger for strangers liking our posts in a pure number where we say, well, it's not just about being liked. It's about being liked by as many people as possible, or it's about, having as many people uh, paying attention to my life as, as I possibly can. And that's where I go, you know, that sounds like a fight for who's the greatest to me. Yeah. You just, you just kind of mentioned it briefly there, but you mentioned it Sunday too. It's just the idea that gr- desiring greatness isn't wrong. So unpack that a little bit for us. Yeah. It's kind of confusing in some ways. It's another one where I think you could talk about that for the whole time. And I wanted to make the point cause I thought it was made in the text truly. Um, that Jesus says, if anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. And so he says, he doesn't say, no one should desire to be first. He says, if anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. So he, he repacks a new vision for greatness. He doesn't condemn the pursuit of greatness. And I'm glad he doesn't, because if he did that, he'd be putting forth a standard that would contradict what it means to be human. I really think all of us have a desire to be great in the eyes of others. Um, and, and I said it's a desire to be recognized, but truly that desire is in front of the truest human desire, which is to be great in the eyes of God. That's really what's going on in our hearts. At the at the bottom of the social media, at the bottom of all of our aspirations for greatness is this desire to be recognized by, by God um, that most people wouldn't acknowledge and to be approved of in the eyes of God. And so that's the desire for greatness ultimately is how can I get the approval and recognition of God, of the one who created me. And the way it manifests itself is uh, the desire for recognition in work by your wife or by your husband or um, the the desire and recognition by your parents as a, as a child. And mm-hmm. these are all ways where w- we strive for security and recognition um, that I think can be really, really good. But the, the problem with those is when they become the very meat of how we view ourselves is like, well, if my parents don't approve of me, then I I'm, don't have value. Well, that's not true. If God approves of you, that that gives you value, yeah. and he does in Christ. And so that's that's where we have to say the desire for greatness isn't a bad thing, but we ultimately have to find our sufficiency in how we view ourselves in God saying we're great and God recognizing us, not man. So those, those must be secondary to him every time. It was fun this past week. Uh, my son's playing basketball and um, there was a, it was just a great illustration of what you talked about. You know, there was a girl on his team, um, actually another family goes to Calvary and she got a basket, you know, and she just ran right over to her grandma who was kind of most accessible family member and gave her this big hug and just that childlike joy that we should be, that is natural and innate in us, but that that we need to be seeking from God. You know, it's important to recognize that, there's something good there. There is something that we do want to pursue, um, but that we want to do that in the right way. Yeah. And to your point, Mark, it, it seems like if your son, if, you know, your wife, if my fiance didn't desire to be recognized in, in your eyes, that would be a problem. Like if a kid mm-hmm. doesn't care what his parents think about him or or if a spouse doesn't care what their spouse thinks about them. That's a problem, you know, to, to say yeah. like, 
you know, Elise, I just don't, like, I only care what God thinks of me. What you think of me just doesn't matter to me. So I'm just going to ignore your vision of me. That That's going to result in terrible things. And so there's, what does it mean to pursue someone in a relationship? It means to present yourself to them as recognizable so that they would yeah. find value in you. Um, so this is a natural part of what it means to be human. But again, it's just the the hierarchy of, well, does this person's approval of me mean everything? Does it does it mean more to me than it should? Am I trying to earn it by comparison with others rather than through um, my relationship to the Lord and to my seeking of him? So, yes, I think it makes sense that that's what happened yeah. on the basketball court, you know. Yeah. Uh, we've already been talking about children a little bit, but that's, that's because that's how Jesus wraps up this section of his teaching. Um, and there were three things that you pointed out about kind of serving or caring for children um, as an object lesson in greatness. And they were that children are vulnerable, that they are dependent or in need, and that they can't pay you back. Um, so, like, what are, who should we be thinking of today that, that kind of are in that position that we need to be uh, serving and caring for and loving? Yeah, it, I, I really uh, wrestled through this one a lot. It was, uh, it, you know, it doesn't seem immediate in your mind. And actually, our children's director here, Jenny Robinson, mentioned this to me after the sermon, and I was like, oh, she's totally right about this. I wish I had sat in that more. It's one of the first groups we can think of is children, <laughs> when he yeah. talks about children. You know, I, I think, again, I think it's a object lesson that points beyond itself, but that doesn't mean that it doesn't also in itself carry some truth, which is... Um, to be great is really to serve children. I think one way to serve this group of people is really to serve the children in our lives, whether that's in the children's ministry, children who are, uh, you know, from our siblings, our, our nephews, our nieces, our sons, our daughters, whatever, um, the children in our lives to really give and serve them is one way that we achieve greatness. I think Jesus's vision really is for us to love children. Um, Beyond that, again, I think he's talking about a wider group of people as well. Um, I, I mentioned we probably think of homeless or refugees pretty instantly when we think of, well, who are the vulnerable? Who are the in need? Which, again, I think is truth, um, that to serve in those ministries is a good thing. It's a good manifestation of this. But without, with risk of repeating what I said on Sunday, um, there's people in need all around us. There, yeah. there really are. Um, and, and I think if most of us slowed down, to ask the question, who in my immediate circles is in need right now? Who in my immediate circles is vulnerable? Who's hurting? Um, who can't pay me back? Like, who are the people yeah. in my life that I can have over for dinner that I know they'll never be able to serve me dinner in the same way? Who, who can I really pour into without the expectation of getting a lot back? Um, I, I think all of us can answer that question in, in our own place of work, in our own family wherever we exist um because you know it, when we open our eyes to the needs of others around us they they're seen to be everywhere and then jesus really wraps that up by saying like he uses the word receive not serve but he says that when we receive the children that we receive him and that by receiving him we receive the father so what is what does that mean to receive god in that way and, and why should we want that this really is Jesus telling us uh, the gospel in, it, in itself, right? When when we demonstrate our ability to serve and love the needy and vulnerable, we demonstrate our ability to serve and love him. Um, <clears throat> the I think of the parable where Jesus is talking about the, the well done, good and faithful servant. Uh, no, these are two, I'm conflating two parables, but regardless, there's, there's one where he's talking to a group of people and he says, well, what you have done, for the imprisoned, what you have done for the homeless, what you have done for the needy, you have done for me. And they say, well, when did we serve you? When did we feed you? When did we come visit you while you were in prison? And Jesus says, yeah. what you've done for these, you've done for me. And this is Jesus saying, um, th this is how you show your love for me, as you love these individuals. And let's always start acts, works come after our salvation every time. We we always have that. We, we are saved, we're met in Christ, we're... Um, given grace by him and our lives are transformed and changed. And this is the same here that when, when our lives are transformed by Jesus, we will start to love the needy. We will start to pursue them and we will show that we've received Christ and that by receiving Christ, we've received God, that this is a mark of really what it means to be 
a Christian, mm-hmm. um, especially this group of people is the group of people that Jesus associated with. He, he associated not with the proud, not with the Pharisees, not with the Sadducees, not with the religious leaders of the day, but the tax collectors, the sinners, those who were in need, those who could pay him nothing back. And and as I said on Sunday, ultimately with us, that, that we are, we're the perfect embodiment of those three characteristics. We're vulnerable, we're, we're in need of mercy, and uh, we ultimately can't pay Christ back for his work. Thanks for that. Thanks for being with me here today. Really appreciate it. Calvary, we are so thankful for you and hope that you can be thinking about who you can be serving and loving as, as we try to pursue greatness the right way. I'd uh, love to invite you to do that at Calvary. It's not the only place you can serve, but we do have opportunities for you. You can hop online and um, a great way to find out how you can serve is through our online connect card. You can fill that out. You can ask for prayer requests there. We love hearing for you. We love praying for you. And uh, yeah, we just hope that you have a great, t- a great rest of your week.